So thanks for tuning in to Online Worship today. I'm Chad. I'm the pastor of Foundry. We're super stoked to have you here. It's been a fantastic holiday season already. I don't know if you caught last week's Christmas in the chapel stream. We filmed that from the gorgeous St. Andrew's Sanctuary. It had Reverend Judy Bezier, had Don Harper playing the organ. It was just a beautiful, beautiful service. And so if you have not caught that yet and you're looking for just kind of a quick 30 minutes, uh, I'd encourage you just to go back in our archive links and, and give that a watch. But before we jump into worship today, there's just a couple of things I want to just invite you to do so we can all in engaged together as we are at, uh, at home or at the camp or traveling or wherever you might be watching this right now. The first one is this. Go ahead and check in on Facebook. I know we as a church work with an organization called Reach. There are hundreds of other churches to do it together. And we pull our resources, pull our money, and every month have a different ministry partner that's doing amazing things. Every December, our check-ins go towards providing books for kids for Christmas. Uh, every five check-ins this month provides a book. So I encourage you to take the time to check in on Facebook and while you're checking in on Facebook, um, if you're watching this live on that stream in Facebook, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on our church online platform, those are all places where you can watch uh, worship and engage with us. What I want to encourage you to do is just to share this stream. You know, sharing the stream is huge. Sharing the stream invites people to watch with you. Uh, it's an incredible way for you to say, you know what, I'm willing to leverage my my social network for uh, for Jesus and for and for my church and for this vision of Jesus big enough. And so I encourage you just to share that stream right now. The last thing is this. If this is your first time worshiping with us, thanks so much. That's a, a really big deal. Like you're sitting down on a Sunday morning or wherever you watch this, and I'm going to watch this church and watch this thing together. Uh, and so we've got a digital connection card. It's either going to be popping in the comments if you're watching this live, or it's going to be up in the description bar above. You know, click that. We want to send you some fun stuff in the mail. We want to thank you for worshiping with us because that's a big deal and we really appreciate it. So I'm excited for us to jump into worship, excited for what Madeline and the team have for us. Uh, and so let's get worship started.
Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide in us, O oh, Lord Emmanuel. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken with Quirinius, who was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. So thank you for engaging to this point in our online worship this uh, morning. It's fantastic having you. And what I want to talk about right now is just a couple of things. Number one is uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve, or Christmas Eve. So thanks so much for engaging to this point in our online worship service today. A couple of things I want to talk to you about. Number one, the Christmas Eve offering. Now we'll be taking this up on the 24th. We've heard from some of you physically. We've also heard from you who worship with us digitally but don't live here in the Monroe area. Um, so every single gift that we have that comes in on the 24th, we're going to give to the two scouting units that are chartered to the church, uh, Cub Scout Pack and a Boy Scout Troop. Uh, we believe in this for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of us have a strong history of scouting. A lot of the leaders in these scouting units come from Foundry. But second, we realize that um, uh, this is a way for us to take responsibility for the larger ministry that is under the roof of our church here uh, because we believe that program provides some very, very essential things to, uh, to, to, to young boys and to young men in our community they might not be able to get elsewhere. We see scouting as an environment where people can experience others, experience relationship, experience change, experience confidence, experience uh, community, all these things that you know, we just can't help but like, not be behind. And so on Christmas Eve, that offering is going to be taken up and it's going to go to uh, the two units that are chartered to us. The second thing is this, and this is just kind of like the tough piece of it, with, with Foundry going back online only, now, your gifts matter always, but as we somehow feel disconnected, we realize that one of the ways that we're, we still are able to be together is how we can we come together with our financial giving. It's like, you know, Jesus, we know that you are still doing things in our midst. And if we say the word became flesh and made his home among us, we realize that he is still calling us as a church uh, to push forward and uh, and to reach people. You gave over a $1,000 uh, to put together the gift cards for the Sterlington area uh, food bank for this Sunday. Uh, we are able to uh, still resource things. We are still able to be with each other. We're still able to do all of our ministry together, and we would not be able to do that without you and without your generosity. And so in just a moment, our giving link is going to pop in. We're going to have uh, about a minute of time just to kind of uh, uh, think about that, go over to the page to give that way. But I want to encourage you to think about this. You know, we say giving is this last level of discipleship. And what's amazing is that the way that we give as the church together today is another way that we just kind of um, are able to, to, to go across uh, these boundaries that we have of not being able to physically be together for worship right now. And so I'm going to pray for us. Oh, Lord, I ask that you just uh, help us to understand what does it mean to be part of something bigger than ourselves. God, we thank you for the generosity that's going to be able to resource people in our community for months to come. Uh, God, over the offering we took up for the food pantry, got those gift cards. God, we pray blessings upon those. Uh, God, we pray for us to have eyes to see the things that you are calling us to. And God, how you have given us every single resource and ability that we, that we need uh, to step fully into this call. God, you've given us the mental strength. God, the emotional strength. You've given us the ability. You've given us the spaces. Uh, God, you've also given us the financial resources to do this. God, we recognize that all these things are coming out of us already, Lord. Um, we believe that you can do more with what we have than we can do with what we have. And we want to be a, a people that release things to you, God. 
So as we uh, go into this time of giving, Lord, we just we offer ourselves to you fully and completely with all that we are, with all that we have. Amen. seen that I've been doing some top five lists for the Christmas Advent season. Uh, that actually started off as a joke. We were testing my microphone on the first Sunday in the new building and I had to keep on talking and uh, after a while you don't have things to talk about anymore so I started making top five lists. But uh, what's interesting and every year it seems to be there's a new Christmas song that people are hating on and uh, it, it, you know it kind of goes through uh, several things. I'm about to pop in a tweet from a, a, a guy named John Acuff about Christmas shoes and how his family has this contest every year about uh, who's the who's the last one to get to hear Christmas shoes. Uh, that's one of the ones people hate. You know, there's a distinct, strong argument about Little Drummer Boy among uh, many folks here at Foundry. Madeline and I are on different sides of it. We only sang Little Drummer Boy last week. Uh, but then there's, there's a new one that I've not seemed to have like, heard so much ruckus over until this year. But there's a lot of folks that really don't like the song, Mary Did You Know. And I was a little surprised to see this. Uh, but, you know, it's it's just interesting. And I was just kind of going through and walking through the comments. And a lot of the people don't like Mary Did You Know. They're really, they're trying to analyze the song lyrics, that sort of a thing. Uh, but it really does kind of make you think of something different. And that's what I've been thinking about so much. Because, uh, you know, this week we read just that story, that kind of classic introduction to the Christmas story from Luke's Gospel. And I think a lot about Mary. Mary's one of those figures, and I talked about this some last week, like we learn a lot about who Mary is and the Magnificat and the way that she shows her thankfulness to God. But I just, I wonder, I'm pretty sure Mary did know. <laughs> I guess that's one way to put it. But you kind of wrap in this whole idea of, I'm about to have my first child. Um, I'm traveling on the road and this whole weird, unique situation with me and Joseph. But then also the fact that I'm carrying this baby that is so much bigger than just this baby. And the questions and the apprehension and that sort of thing that Mary probably had going on. So this Sunday is going to be a little different if you've not caught by now. Um, I'm not going to preach the whole sermon in my truck. But what we're going to do in just a moment is we're going to pop over to a conversation I had this week with two people. Uh, one with Lindsay Killen, who's our Director of Administration at Foundry. Her and her husband, Will just had their second child a few months ago, a little, boy, a little boy named Jack Henry. He's awesome, he's cute. Once he brings him to staff meeting, I always wanna hold him. And then we're gonna have a conversation as well with Crystal Coleman. She's one of our board members and her and her husband Clinton are expecting their first daughter, uh, Conley Ray, in the next few months. And so since I've never had a baby before and I don't know what that feels like and I know that a lot of people watching this, all the guys, we've never had babies. So I wanna kinda get the perspective from like new moms and from that, that thing is we kind of jump into this conversation about Mary and how we see the Mary story as this example of renormaling. Uh, we look at her behaviors and her thoughts, but today what we're really going to talk about is what does it mean to know that something bigger is on the horizon. So we're going to pop into that Zoom conversation and I'm going to see y'all back in my office. That's where we'll finish things up. That's all I can think. How scary not knowing, knowing that you're going to go into labor anytime, but not knowing, not having any kind of plan. You don't know, you don't have anywhere to stay. You don't have a doctor. You don't have anybody to help you deliver a baby. You don't have, you don't have anything. You got Joseph and your donkey. <laughs> not only just having a baby, but she's like, having the son of God. Like, can you imagine? The so what I'm, I'm really kind of thinking about is ha having people kind of attached to what I, the emotions that Mary might have had. Yeah. And you want to do everything right. And, and being 
solely responsible for an, another life, that's a responsibility that is very scary, very humbling also, you know, that you get to, you get to mold and teach and create and, um, oh, it's just, it's amazing just watching, watching them grow, you know, it's like, oh, I did all that. Me and Clinton, you know, decided to start trying, right? So I was thinking about that when we started talking about it. I already had, don't get me wrong, it happened faster than I anticipated. So there was still a lot of shock factor. But I mean, from Mary's perspective, having it be a complete surprise, you know, I can't even imagine because this is a whole new world, a lot of feelings, even when you're, you know, you're ready, even when you've planned it, you know what I mean? But to have to kind of it be a complete surprise like that, I can't, I just personally can't imagine. But so for me, the, there's been a lot of different feelings. And of course, I'm so excited to meet her. And I'm so, I can't wait to hold her and all the things. But this is a new season. I don't know what it's going to be like to be a mom. I cannot imagine being a mom, you know? So it's very, I mean, there's a lot of anxiety in it, you know, really. Um, even I prepped for it. I planned for it. I wanted it, but there's still so many emotions that go through your head. Like, I don't know how to do this. This is, I mean, this is something I've never, <laughs> I've never done before. How am I going to, how am I going to be at this mom thing? You know? So it's, it's, it's so exciting and I can't wait, but on the other hand, you are, there is a part of you who is just like, I'm so nervous about this. And being a boy mom, just, and knowing the rest of the story also, you know, seeing, you know, she, so she, she has this boy and then as a boy mom, I know the rest of the story also. And knowing that this boy is going to be brutally murdered at the end of his story just is heart wrenching. You know, but knowing all the good that he would do in the world, it's just seeing it from her point of view, there is a proud sadness about the entire thing. Like, can you imagine the pressure? I mean, you know what I mean? Really, you know, and so, um, but so for me, I mean, I think I do look at it like, this has been, I'm trying to figure out a word that it's not really easy. Um, this has been something that, you know, most women just like, can't wait for. They, you know, this is like the moment you can't wait to be pregnant, can't wait to be a mom. And knowing like now all the things you don't know going into pregnancy, going into like this transition, not only on your body, but you just how it takes like an emotional toll on you. I can't imagine her going through that and it being a complete surprise and just like the whole, the whole thought process behind it does change. Like looking at the Christmas story is different this year in that now that I'm going through what the, the physical part of it and the, the, the transition of my mind of going from being just me and Clinton to I'm gonna have to take care of this person like this person's coming into the world that I'm responsible for forever um that is a, a whole transition so to think that you know now I'm looking at it almost from her perspective which I don't really know that I've really ever looked at the Christmas story from Mary's perspective before because I hadn't walked it you know and everything that you you know, you experience in your life, I feel like you have so much more empathy for somebody when you've walked that situation. And not that I've, you know, don't get me wrong, she still wins, but I'm just saying like, you know, being just being pregnant with your first child in general, going through that in, in this season really does make you think to, to how, how that must have been for her, like how much really honored she was I'm sure but stressed and anxious she was about it at the same time you know that's yeah. and then knowing that you have to give birth in a dirty barn like I I did want to have more control over my birth plan after <laughs> thinking about it this way yeah <laughs>
I want to thank Crystal and Lindsay for popping onto that because like I said, I've never had a baby before. I don't know what this, this thing of anticipation is like, but what I want us to do is for a moment, you know, just kind of get inside of the mind of what Mary might have been thinking about. Uh, you know, we read earlier our, our main passage for the day, Luke chapter 2, 1 through 5, but I want to read something else to you. And it's a prophecy from a guy named Micah. And I think this might have been one of the things that Mary was thinking about is she rode into Bethlehem, this city that she might not have ever been to before. Bethlehem is just um, a short journey away from Jerusalem. It's like five or six miles. In many ways, you could call it like a suburb of Jerusalem. It was, it was further than you'd want to go in one day. But let's pop into this prophecy from Micah. Chapter 5, we will read verses 1 through 5. This is what we read. Mobilize, marshal your troops. The enemy is laying siege to Jerusalem and they will strike Israel's leader in the face with a rod. But you, O Bethlehem Frath, are only a small village among all of the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origin is in the distant past will come to you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth, and then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And there his people will live undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace. So think about this. Micah, it's kind of funny because Micah is a... Uh, it's a forgotten prophet. You know, the prophecy in Micah, he was a contemporary um, of Isaiah. He, he was there at the same time, but you know, his prophecy is small. It's almost forgotten about, except for he's the person that names Bethlehem as the place that the Messiah will come from. So imagine Mary with all of the other preparation thoughts and stuff that she has going on is now riding into this town. Now imagine she might be thinking back Back to the visions, to the dreams, to the angelic encounter, to the situation and uh, of her with her cousin Elizabeth, all of this and thinking, you know, is this the story that is coming true? Is this prophecy happening inside of my very womb right now? Just imagine what that looks like. Imagine like that level of preparation going on in her mind. So a couple of things about this prophecy that really help us to understand what might be going on. In verse 5-1, uh, really Micah puts this inside of the, uh, the, the version of the story of saying, you know, it can't get any worse. The enemy is at our gates. And then he references some other things that happened. There was a king named Jehoiakim, and there was an embarrassment because he was drug out of Jerusalem while it was being destroyed by the Babylonians. And he was ridiculed in the face of the city defenders that were left. And then they carted him off to Jerusalem and then saying, you know what? You have this king and you say that he has power and you say that his family is anointed by God, but you know, we're going to take this guy back to our own place. Just this, this root of embarrassment, but also this awareness of the absolute lack of depth in their leadership that's going on. And part of this prophecy uh, begins bringing things out, but it starts off in verse, verse 2. It speaks of insignificance. You know, Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrath means place of plenty. You know, the role of Bethlehem and this whole region of Jerusalem was just there to make sure food was in the city. Now, and we know that food is essential, all that sort of thing, but think about the way that a lot of like urban city dwellers might think of those who live outside of the city and are responsible for their agricultural economy. You know, they're they're kind of looked down on. They're seen as country folks. I, I think of the Tom Petty song, uh, Southern Accent, and this is this kind of uh, like, you know, you might think I'm dumb, but I'm necessary. Like this whole thing, Bethlehem was this sleepy little forgotten town. It was almost worthless, except way, way, way back long ago is where David came from. King David, uh, the beginning of the royal line of the house of Israel, a man after God 
God's own heart that, that people had been yearning for a king like David. In fact, if you open your Bibles up and you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, they compare every king to David and what David did. And so this town is known for this is where David came from, this the insignificant last son who in the prophet Samuel came uh, to see the sons of Jesse, which he was told by God that one of them would be king. He got to the end and was like, hey, this, this isn't all of them. Do you have anybody left? Because this isn't the one that God wants. And Jesse said, oh, yeah, well, I've got my youngest son. But he's like back with the horses making sure the baggage is all right. And they go find David and bring him out. Um, think of also the story of Ruth. You know, the story of Ruth takes place in Bethlehem. Boaz was David's great-grandfather, I think. And so in this tiny little forgotten, sleepy, insignificant town, big things have happened before. I wonder if Mary's thinking about that as she just kind of goes down into uh, Bethlehem. But then this last thing in verse 5-4, it, it speaks about the peace. It speaks about the rule of this person. Uh, and it doesn't use the normal word for a king. It, it has its own little language it talks about inside of this prophecy, but this is a ruler that will be qualitatively different from what has come before in the past. You know, instead of faulty leadership that led the people astray, instead now we are going to be having good leadership. We're going to be having proper leadership. We're going to be having uh, the type of leadership that we actually need in order to bring God's you know, reign and peace about with everything we do. It also speaks that he will be the source of peace. It's uh, from him will all of these things spring forth. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's this, it, it, it brings this idea of not just prosperity, but it will also put the people back inside of a relationship uh, with God, but also within God's uh, righteousness. Like, what does it mean for God's people to be reunited with Him and what He has been doing? Because God's people, for that, for, in this prophecy in Micah, but also in Mary, they knew they had been separate from God. You know, uh, they had not been hearing from God. They had felt abandoned. These things still, you know, and Mary's uh, experiences hundreds of years in the future. Future, but these things still haven't come to pass. They still are there. There's still problems. And I think really the, the, the whole crux, the thing for us to begin thinking about as we look at this story and we, uh, and we begin prayerfully engaging it in our own lives. Remember, we've been talking about renormaling. We've been talking about how do we see Advent, this historical and traditional beginning of the Christian year, as a way for us to hit reset and for us to truly experience a different life in 2021 than we might have. And so much of this is inside of this story, this prophecy, the way that Micah lays it out. And it's this statement right here I want you to think about is this, that your best past isn't even adequate enough for God's future. Your best past isn't adequate enough for God's future. That way we really see uh, this story telling the way that this, this, this prophetic Messiah, this ruler, this leader, this king that is riding inside of Mary's belly as they're coming up into the hill country of Judea from Galilee that this king is inside of her and what's going on in her mind, that your, your most adequate vision that you have of your, it, it's just not even good enough. Like even everything that we can imagine is just simply not there. Our best past isn't even adequate enough for God's future. And that really just drives us to asking some questions. And like we've done for the last few weeks, I just want to encourage you to go over to myfoundry.life. Now click on those message notes. If you're watching this live, um, uh, some dialogue about where to get this should be popping up in the comment bar. But these are some questions I want us to ask ourselves today, but also ask as we engage this whole idea leading up towards Christmas Eve in just a few days. But this first one is this. How do we step into an envisioned future with the reality that Jesus Christ has given us? You know, we know these things. We know He loves us. We know that He died for us. We know all of the truths and the promises of Scripture. What does it mean for us to own own them in a different way that leads us to a different experience with Him. You know, what do we need to just go ahead and call out the bankrupt practices we have in our life? You know, uh, I, I'm really bad at email. And ever since Gmail came out over 10 years ago, you don't have to worry about your inbox size anymore. And so I had this horrible habit of, I will look at emails, I will check them, I will 
most likely respond to them, but I'll just leave them sitting in my inbox. And every few months, I'll get to the point where my inbox has hundreds, if not over a thousand emails just sitting right there. And only like 10% of them matter. And so what I have to do is I have to declare email bankruptcy. I know that I've engaged with stuff at the level I kind of need to, but in order to clear my headspace to move forward, and it's kind of like this productivity hack I've had in my own life. I just select all archive all. I know if I need them in the future, I can find them in the archives, the search functions there, but I will declare email bankruptcy. I'll say, you know what, this just no longer is adequate enough for me to work out of. I need to clear my head. I need to clear my to-do list. I need to clear the way that I am seeing what my daily routine needs to look like. So I declare email bankruptcy. You know, I'm doing my best inside of this. I've responded to things for the most part in the ways that I need to, but it's just gotten sloppy. It's no longer working because it's crowded and cloudy and just it's it, it i have to delete them all you know what are the practices that we have in our life where we just need to declare um just just bankruptcy of saying you know what I've been trying to do that for years and it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't fix anything. Or this is a behavior that I always fall back into. And you know what? It, it never actually makes anything better. I just see myself, uh, it's a sloppy, it's a lazy practice. No, these are the things that, that I just say, th this is not going to propel me in sort in, in, into this envisioned future that Jesus has for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ditch that. I'm going to get rid of it. And the second thing is this, that our best past is not adequate enough for God's future. We've said that already, but I want to think Think about that a little bit. You know, how have we forced Jesus to settle in our life? And a lot of this just goes back to the age old thing saying, oh, well, God, God, I want to do things my way. Let me do things my way. Hey, let me take care of this. You know, I want, I want to do this on my own. Where, you know, Jesus loves us. We know Jesus is never going to abandon us. But how have we just locked him into our jankiness because we're forcing him to settle. We're forcing him to deal with our inadequate lives and response and ideas and visions. Um, you know, I, our king has been taken outside of the city gates, has been had his pants pulled down and gotten whooped in front of everybody. He's gotten embarrassed and ridiculed, has carted off, but we're still trying to claim to, like, lay claim to that king and say, oh, we need, we just need him to come back. We just need him to come back. You know, what are the practices in life that actually have embarrassed us? The ways that we've acted, the ways that we've behaved, and us saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finally realize that those things are just not going to move me forward. And that's the last thing is this. How can we be riding into Bethlehem with this prophecy in mind as we prepare for Christmas Eve. And I've got a wild Christmas Eve message. I cannot, I told Madeline about it and she's like, are you seriously gonna do that, Chad? I've, I've got one of those planned. But as we just prepare for that, let's 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 prepare by, like we're riding into Bethlehem. We know what's been going on. We've had encounters with the living God. He has spoken to us. We've talked about thankfulness. We've had this conversation today about getting rid of the things that we need to get rid of. But what, as we are riding into Bethlehem, where do we need to see peace? Where do we need to see the source of peace in our lives? Where are the places where we need to absolutely declare the power and the possibility in the presence of Jesus Christ right there? You know, where are the spaces in our life where we are pregnant with anticipation? And I want us to identify those things, but then I also want us to practice the biblical action of yielding those things over and saying, God, these are the, these are the places I'm excited about. Lord, these are the places I see possibility, I see a future, I see good things for, and I want to give them over to you because I want to see your future and not my future because I know that my future is not adequate enough to live in your world. And because of your son, Jesus Christ, coming into our world, I have the ability to live in your world, to become holy to be faithful, to trust you, all of these things. Lord, this is what I'm excited about, and now I want to give those things over to you. Remember, your best past isn't adequate enough for God's future. Let's pray. Father, as we, as we sit here, as we think about these things, as we contemplate just this emotional state that Mary was in, Lord, we want to prepare ourselves as well. We want to prepare ourselves for what is best. We want to pre prepare ourselves for an exciting encounter with the living God. God, we also come to you just needing things to be uh, irreversibly different. 
God, we want that to happen. And we know the best way for us to do that is to, to flip the practices that we might have been leaning into for years and for us to instead say, Lord, this is what I'm excited about. Lord, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm hopeful about. And now I give that thing over to you for you to do your work in it, God. Because even as talented as you've made us, as, 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 as the person you've made us to be, Lord, you're still bigger than us. Lord, it's that's what we offer right now. Shall we pray? Amen. You could have come like a mighty storm With all the strength of a hurricane You could have come like a forest fire With the power of heaven in your flame But you came like winter snow quiet and soft and slow falling from the sky in night to the earth below you could have swept in like a tidal the sky in the night to the